All right, welcome back. Today, in this chapter, we are going to talk about the forms of real estate ownership. Remember, in a previous chapter, we talked about the degree to which you owned it. Today, we are going to talk about the form in which you take that degree of ownership. There are a lot of people that get these confused and for, I think, the wrong reason. So that's the way to understand it. In the previous chapter, we talked about the degree of ownership, fee simple, absolute. Today, we are going to talk about the form in which you take that degree. And there are three ways in which you can take that ownership in some form. You either take it the first way as a single owner, all right? <clears throat> You would take ownership as some kind of co-ownership. That's the second way. And then the third way is going to be in the form of a trust. Those are the three forms of ownership in which you would take this estate. And remember, the estate is defined by possession. So let's go through these three different forms of ownership. The easiest one is when it's owned by one entity, one person, all right? That is called ownership in severalty. Now, I know that that word sounds kind of funny because you think the word several means many. That is not where the word comes from. The word comes from the root word to sever, you sever yourself away from the rest of the population by being the only owner to the property, all right? So a single owner owns the property in what is called severalty, and it's pronounced that way. When we're in class, I usually make people pronounce it, pronounce the word several, T, severalty. That's how it's pronounced. So you can hit pause and do that if you want. The second form of ownership is some form of co-ownership, or you often hear it called concurrent owners. So you've got co-ownership, more than one, so two or more. Theoretically, it could be an unlimited number. Uh, I think the most I've ever seen is four or five. So when you take that property as a co-owner, or concurrent, meaning at the same time, there are two forms in which you take this concurrent ownership. So let's switch over to here. All right. So the first form of ownership that you would take is what they call a joint tenant. Actually, I want to do the other one first. It's the easier one. The first form is called a tenant in common. Tenant in common. The slang for that is called a tick. T-I-C, tenants in common, all right? Now, with a tenants in common, I like to draw this picture like a pie because what you can see here in this particular case we have three concurrent owners or three co-tenants. And each one of these three people are members in this tenants in common. There is only one thing that is required that they have to possess equally. And that is tenancy. Or, if you want to think of it a different way, the possession. Remember the possession twig that we talked about in the bundle of rights? The only thing these guys share in common is the tenant of this building. They get to be or they get to possess that building. That is the only thing they share in common. That's the only thing they are required to share. Hence the word tenants in common should be an easy one to remember. Now, with tenants in common, there are several things about that that are unique. 
in this example that I've drawn on the screen, and I'm going to make these numbers up. This guy owns 15%. This guy owns 35%. And this guy owns 50%. Now, this is what they call disproportional shares. And in the tenants in common, they are allowed to have disproportional shares, meaning they don't have to be the same amount. They can have different amounts. And as you can see, one owns 15%, one owns 35%, one owns 50%, all right? Now, here's the important thing that you need to understand about these disproportional shares. Well, there's two things. The first is proportional shares are allowed. So don't think that if you see ownership with three people and each own a 33 and a third, that it can't be a tick. It still can be. Proportional shares can be allowed. Disproportional shares can be allowed. And you'll see in the other one why that's important. Now, here's the important part about these disproportional shares. They are what's called undividable interest. All right. So when I say that uh, Alan here, A, owns 15% of the interest in the property, he does not own 15% of the physical property. He cannot go in and say, well, these 15 bricks are mine. I'm going to take those bricks home with me. No, it's not 15% of the physical asset. It's 15% of the interest in that asset. And Bob owns 35% of the interest in that asset. Charlie owns 50% of the interest on that asset. So they are a disproportional, undividable interest. Very important you understand that. The in it's the interest that they own. It's the interest in the ownership. It is not the physical building. I can't take my half and leave, all right? So each one of these people have an undividable, disproportional interest that can be allowed. The second thing is, because each one has their own interest, each one of these people have their own title work to show the interest. So like in Alan's case, it would say 15% owner in the property located at 12 Smith Street, where Bob's might say as 35% owner of the property located at 12 Smith Street. And Charlie's is going to say as 50% owner of the property located at 12 Smith Street. Each one of them has their own title work. Now, because of that, that allows for the <clears throat> their interest to be treated, and I'm going to use the word normal mom and pop real estate. Now, the reason I drew this as a pie, because I want to do one other thing here to help clarify this. Because each one has their interest, B could sell his property or sell his interest in the property to someone else just like normal mom and pop real estate. Think about an apple pie. You could take a slice out of that apple pie and put another slice back in without disturbing the rest of the pie. Theoretically, Bob could sell his interest without even asking Alan or Charlie, A or C, because it is treated like normal mom and pop real estate. If Bob were to die, his interest would go into his will and be distributed amongst his heirs. That is one of the most popular parts about 
having a tenant in common is the fact that the interest that that owner has can be bought, sold, traded, leased, exchanged, willed, just like normal real estate, all right? So this is the first way that you could take co-ownership, and you would declare this when you buy the property, all right? The purchase agreement would say A, B, and C as tenants in common, so that the title company knew that they were going to have to make three sets of title work, one for A, one for B, and one for C. And then when B sells his, it would go through the normal process, and D, the incoming buyer, would get new title work that shows he is now 35% owner of the tenants in common at 12 Smith Street, and his title work would have a newer date on it, right? Understand that. You know, when they bought this property way back here in, you know, let's say 2000, and then D comes in in 2020. So his got a different date on the title work as well as a separate title uh, insurance policy. Cool? All right. So the second type of co-tenants is what we're going to call joint tenants. Now I draw this, once again, back to my favorite cup of water here. And there's a reason I do water versus a pie. As joint tenants, there are four things that are required that must be in place. If any of these four things are not in place, it is not a joint tenant. They are required by the definition itself of joint tenants. The first one is they must be proportional shares. Every one of the tenants has to have the same amount. In this example, there are four of them. Therefore, each one owns a 25% interest in the property. It cannot be disproportional. It cannot be. It is required that it is proportional. So that's what I was trying to get, allude to here a minute ago. In tenants in common, they could have the same amount. So don't look at those two things and think that's going to be the deciding factor is tenants in common or joint tenants. No, because tenants in common are allowed to have disproportional, but they could have proportional. Whereas in joint tenants, you are not allowed to have disproportional. You just automatically get a proportional share. If there were 10 of them, they'd each own 10%. If there were five of them, they'd each own 20%. If there were 100 of them, they'd each own 1%. They have to have proportional shares. Now, it is still undividable meaning A cannot look at 25% of the bricks of the building and go, well, those 25% of the bricks are mine because it's not the physical asset. Understand that. It's the interest of the ownership that A owns. He owns 25% of the interest in the ownership. Now, those four things that I mentioned a minute ago are called unities. There are four things that have to have unity. Back here, the only thing they had in unity was possession. That's the only thing that's required, all right? In joint tenants, they've got four of them that they have to have. The first one, like the other, obviously is possession. That's the first thing they must share has to be possession. I just told you 
The second thing they have to have is interest. They must all have the same amount of interest. They must all be on the same title work. It is one title work which names all four of them. So it, the title work would say something like, as joint tenants, Alan, Bob, Charlie, and David to the property located at 12 Smith Street. Now notice two things. One, one title work names all four names. Second thing is, you notice we did not disclose the amount of interest like we did in tenants in common. Why? We don't have to because it has to be proportional. So there are four names on it. You know each one owns 25%. So this is a case for you math people. I like math. This is a case where there were four title works with one name on it for tenants in common. And here there is one title work with four names on it for joint tenants. <laughs> They're not equal, not like math, all right? So tenants in common in this particular case, I guess there was three, it was a bad number. There's three title works, each naming one person. Here there's one title work naming all the concurrent owners. In this example, there were four. The third or fourth thing they must have in common is they all received the ownership at the exact same time. There cannot be different times that they received it, all right? And it was typically through an operation of law. Let me give you an example of a real case that I was involved with uh, several years ago. Grandfather left the uh, farm to the four grandkids as joint tenants to the property located, and it was a farm. All right, so the thing right out of the gate was his will called for it to be a joint tenant. He named the four grandkids and they all got it at the same time. They were all on the same title work. Because he called out joint tenants, they all four got the equal interest and all four of them were allowed to work the farm for profit. This is a very common example of how joint tenants work. All right. There must be four unities, whereas tenants in common only had the one, which was possession. Now, joint tenants have a very special clause inside of it. And this is the key thing to remember for your exam, and for your career down the road. Joint tenants have a very special clause called with the right of survivorship. And a lot of times on uh, title work, you might see JTWRS. Now, I will tell you that that is not mandatory to put on there because by definition, joint tenants always have the right of survivorship. Now, what the right of survivorship means is this. 